It's 1964 and as yet the police from the South Coast Resort of Farmerton have been unable to find the killer of local GP Dr Wade. Elsewhere, work on a horrendous motorway has been halted by an archaeological dig, much to the annoyance of dodgy MP Anthony Schooner and his sidekick row contractor Chubby Riley. Meanwhile, strange underground noises continue to be heard by the somewhat concerned mine workers. Very, a very exciting day at Farmington tomorrow. Big local football derby. Limpton Rovers are playing Farmington Athletic at home and it has to be said the police are expecting a little bit of trouble. Not only that, it is the first day of the holiday season, so this station is going to be thronging with people. Busy, busy, busy. Now, we've seen the station canopies being made, but we haven't yet talked about the actual station buildings, which have suddenly popped up miraculously. Alan, a member of our modelling team, he's been responsible for that. Alan, how did you build the station buildings? Basically, we just got lots of kits and bashed them together, really, to make one big building. Now, they're fantastic. Now, are these plastic kits? Yeah, they're plastic kits, yeah. Now, wh when you get them from the shop, they don't look like that, do they? No, they're about four inches long and about an inch and a half wide. So what you've done is you've taken a load of kits and stuck them together, is it? Yeah, it's about ten altogether there. But, of course, the other thing is, these are originally designed for straight platforms, and we've got our station is curved, our platform's curved. So how do you get around that? Well, basically, we just bent the plastic pieces between our fingers like that and made the outside edge... So slightly the longer. So, so, so the plastic's got enough giving it to, to yeah, bend around the corner like that. It. And as lovely as the buildings are, the whole station does look a little bit uninhabited. So Brian, how can we make this look a bit more funky and lived in? Well, you need poster boards. Uh, posters are a big giveaway for what period a, a, a railway is, really. The posters are a good thing. Now, I've had a crack at building some posters and signs. What I've done, any of you with a computer, uh, and maybe a digital camera can have a crack at this. This is quite a little, good little project to do. And using a bit of um, photo manipulative software, what I've done is take all my images. Now, some of these are photographs that I took, some I've got from the internet, and some I've scanned in from magazines and books. What I've done is I've put them onto an A4 sheet of paper and just shrunk them down to size. Now, I have to say that did use up four days of my life. But there is an easier way, isn't there, Alan? There certainly is. And that easier way is? Buy some of these. Buy some of these. Now, how much do these cost? About £2.50. £2.50 versus four days of your life. It's not a hard decision to make, is it? So, armed with these and some of mine, because I'm still going to use them because I put all the effort in, let's have a crack at making this a little bit more funky and lived in. Let's go. Can I do the posters? Because I yeah, did definitely. spend four days of my life doing it. <laughs> So the old station's coming on a treat, isn't it? What we've done, we've added some benches, lamps, a few people, some posters, some notice balls, some little trolleys. It's amazing what a difference a little bit of detail makes. Obviously, we've still got some work to do. We've got a baluster track, obviously the station name, Farmington, that's got to go on. Some other bits and bobs, but we're almost there. Right, back to Farmington Athletic. Now, they've got a big match on tomorrow, and at the moment, they haven't got a ground to play in. So what they need is a stadium. And it just so happens, I know a bloke what does stadiums. The man in question is Bob Russell. Bob's models have proved a huge hit in the States. In particular, the resin cast replicas of America's most famous stadiums. The incredible thing to me is that you can see underneath and through to all the different stands. So how long would something like that take to make? Just that, I mean, to for us to sculpt the original, um, we have to sculpt it in a lot of separate pieces, which are then all assembled up together. And it would take one person about three weeks to make that model. I mean, it is incredibly detailed. And, of course, this chappy here. Can I have a look at him? Yeah, sure. Look at that. That is stunning. Typically, when we build a stadium like one of these, we're working from photographs. We will 
firstly attempt to draw a, a floor plan of the stadium or the building from photographs and we won't worry about how big it is to start with we will just attempt to get it accurate once we've got it accurate we'll then uh, work out a ratio scale to take it down to the size that the client wants. And any idea of the scale this would be in? If we were thinking about uh, the scales? Well, let's just try to work this out. Um, so three inches, 300 yards, 100 yards at the end. I think this is, I think, I, I think they're all fantastic, but I mean, it's the... So that's one in 3,600. One in 3,600. That's, well, that's a lot smaller than one we're building at the moment, so we're building double O. Yeah, which is about one seventy second, isn't it? Six foot. Now, this is on a slightly bigger scale. Slightly bigger isn't scale, it? This yes. Is a slightly bigger scale. Yeah. Uh, I've nicknamed her Lucy. Yes, I think now, it's I, 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 It caught my eye. I don't know why. Yeah. It just I just happened to notice it out of the corner of my Perhaps because it because, wasn't a stadium. Because because it wasn't a stadium and the detail work. I mean, look at the detail on that, as they say. Um, lots. Of, I'd like to. I'd like to spend more time looking at the detail on that. But I think we've got to crack on, because we need to build Farmton Athletic a football ground. So let's pop Lucy down there. Lovely as she is, I think we'll have to pop her down there for a minute. So Farmton Athletic. It's 1964. Yep. So what are we making this out of? Well, this is all made out of uh, easily available plastic card and pre-made corrugated iron sheets. So what did you base this on? This is based on a real stadium in a small Sussex town, one end of which is completely untouched from when it was built in the 60s. So this, this, this is the, the, the sort of the corrugated iron end of it. So we we're going we're to produce this sort of effect on the model. Okay. So now you've scratch built this whole thing, haven't yeah. you? The details here, the door yeah. and the windows and these little ventilation well, that, that's just there. made with various types of plastic sheeting, which we can buy. So you've built all this now, so what's the next stage? Well, we're going to make the roof. Um, I've got two bits part done here. These will be set up against each other like this. Three of those on the inside to make sure the angle stays correct and it all holds together. So just a bit of glue on there. When you're doing some of these, you usually build with plastic rather than card. Yes, I find, I find plastics much less damageable. Now what's that stuff there? It literally dissolves the, the surface of the plastic. Sort of melts the plastic together, welds the plastic yes, together. It, yes, it, it welds it by, by dissolving the, the two surfaces. Yeah. So there's our roof section done. Yep, I've got, just got to do a, a top edge on that. But before I do that, I want to start doing these end pieces because I want to see exactly how far my coping has got to come uh, over okay, the edge okay. and until I've got the end pieces on. You're not going to know. And all you're going to do is lay it on the top there. And just draw around it. All right, so nip her in there. Will you cut that with a razor saw? Because it's quite thick, isn't it, that plastic? Uh, yes, fortunately it'll, it'll, it'll bend and snap. She lives on there. Yeah. That is uh, great. Now we're there. Now we're yeah. getting there. I'll be happy with that. The overhang is all at the front like that. Okay. But I've got to have just enough overhang at the back so that Oh, it covers the, the when the I next could put sheet. the corrugated sheet on the back. Okay. It covers that up. So a few more finishing touches, and that's our Farmington Athletic stand complete, right. which is great. Yeah. So it'll be ready for next Saturday. That's a big local derby. Yeah. And I've got a seat in the director's box, and I'm just wondering who I can take with me. Funnily enough. I was actually wondering what Lucy was going to be doing next Saturday. I, I really don't know. You'd best ask her. I wonder if she'd like to come with me. I'm sure she Do would. You think she'd I hope so. Here we are then. This is it. This is the finished stand. Look at that. That is sex on a stick. Feast your eyes on the glory that is Farmerton Athletic. 
look at that what we've done we've given it a paint job and a bit of weathering and it is a stunning building we've got the drain pipes the dressing room entrance one of the things we haven't done is we haven't put this is where the visitors versus Farmington Athletic would be and the only other thing we've got to do which is one of the most important things of course is this sign here which is Farmington Athletic bless your eyes right a lovely bit of kit we're going to pop her in there this is our ground now i know the football fans amongst you think it's the most important thing in the town it should stay here but it can't it's got to go back over there now the more observant amongst you can't have failed to notice that we also have a pitch no prizes for guessing how we made this it's a sheet of card covered with pva and then liberally scattered with scatter material or flock now we had a very good season last year and a generous benefactor had given us these flood lighting here we go look at that they even work these cost about 12 quid a pop but i think they're lovely now they're not quite prototypical for 1964 but you know what who cares you've got to treat yourself sometime haven't you so these are natty little affairs they run off 16 volts and all we've done is drill a hole through the bottom of the baseboard stick them in and connect them up to uh well in this case a 12 volt power supply so they're a little bit under power so they should last longer and they look a little bit more realistic I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to put some money on Farmington to win tomorrow and I advise you to do the same because you know what we're going to do? We're going to kick the living daylights out of the team tomorrow. We may not be a fair team but we are hard. It's a rather sad day today in Farmington with the funeral of Mr Brian Bennett, head of the local planning authority. His recent death has come as a bit of a shock, not least to Jack Sparrow, the dashing young replacement to murder GP Dr. Wade. The funny thing is, he'd only pop round to check on Brian's irritated chafing, and he watches him drop dead in front of him. Still, there you go. It's a nice day for a funeral, Brian. So t tell us what's happening here. Well, this is, the, this is the scene of the funeral procession, which is actually a train. Mr. Bennett was nutty about narrow gauge railways. All oh, right, right? Yeah. this is his great passion. The local funeral director, Arthur Colbreth, um, he, he's hastily found this little van, right, which is the brake van of the tin mine trains. But uh, they had to put some urns on the top of the of the roof, so they found something for that. So what? Are this? this is a model of the brake van. Now I've never ever heard of a, uh, a railway funeral. Did they have such a thing? Yes, yes they did, yeah. Uh, on the Festin York Railway in Wales, in fact they still use it. Uh, really? Some people want funerals. So would it have looked like that? Yeah, pretty similar, but uh, the one on the Festin York was just a goods van with four urns on the roof. Which is, you've got some urns on there now. What have you made the urns out of? Well, you can usually find bits and pieces like that off old lamp tops, gas lamp tops, that's all. Okay, so we need a couple more. So if I glue them on, well, I've got some glue here. Now, I didn't actually realise that, of course, Now, Brian doesn't just build huge models like Farmington, and I thought this would be a nice opportunity to look at some smaller examples of his work. Now, they're all on the same scale that Farmington's being modelled on, but obviously just a little bit tinier. Now, let's start with this one here. Why did you want to show me this one, Brian? Well, it's an example of what's called modeller's licence. Um, real uh, locations are very big, and this station, if we modelled it to scale, would be probably at least 12 feet long. So it'd be huge. So this is part of the trick is to compress it all down and to cheat the eye. And so, I mean, it's all about perspectives, because you're actually standing here you were explaining to me weren't you, you you'd yeah. see things at a different angle well if you were standing here looking up the line your view would be compressed in perspective and the same the other way so the the, the overall sense you'd have of the place would be a, a much smaller than, than it actually is in reality because there's a station over here this is on the same line isn't it this is uh, the same yes this is Bratton Fleming now because when you look at a model of course it never looks the same as when you're looking at the real thing does it well, uh, earlier on we were measuring the distance between our eyes, weren't we? Oh, yeah. And we, we discovered it was about two and a half inches on yeah, average. Yeah, I'll tell you what, come back from the pub, one eye's here and one eye's there. That doesn't really <laughs> count. Respect is all gone. That's right. But uh, if your eyes are two and a half inches apart, then they're 16 feet in this scale. And so obviously if your eyes are that far apart, you're going to have a much bigger sense of perspective and scale than you would have otherwise. So when you're looking at a model like this, it's never going to look the same as it does in real life. 
No, and it's a different sense of perception which gives the model a sort of different form of reality. Reality, really. yeah. Well, that's what gives models a charm. Probably is, yeah. Now, I love this. Earlier on in the series, I showed you a signal box at Sheffield Park, which is on the Blue Bell Railway. And here is exactly what that signal box would have looked like. Well, it, it was based on sort of railways of Sussex, which are the old London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, which is, of course, the Blue Bell's origins. So you've got some standard gauge trotting around here, and you've managed to work in a narrow gauge railway as well. But what I happen to notice is your little church here. Tell me about that. The real building that I base that on is actually a pump house. And uh, the, the window has, uh, in reality, got an iron grating. And this little thatched cottage. Well, I built that about 25 years ago now. And uh, that uh, was, uh, had a different technique for doing thatch to the one on Farmerton. It's actually corrugated cardboard with plaster on top, and on top of that is the bristles of an old paintbrush. That works very well, doesn't it? Well, let's have a look at something else. Now, you've got a more rural scene over here. What are we looking at here? This is a sort of on the fringe of Dartmoor. It's around 1947-48. Uh, the British railways have been created, the railways have been nationalised, and that time you've got all the old company liveries, but you've also got the new British Railways ones as well. It's a great station building. I love the station building. In fact, I like all this landscape because you give it a sense of space in such a small area, don't you? Well, I've tapered the road slightly towards the distance, and the little cyclist there is actually quite a small model, and so it gives you a, a sense uh, okay. of Okay, so you get a bit more perspective. Really like the cabbages. Can we have cabbages in Farmerton? Lots and lots of cabbages. Because I do fancy a little allotment. Yeah, it'd be really nice. Want to go green. Well, Brian, this is my favourite. Tell me about this. Now, one thing I couldn't help but notice, you have got a lot of buildings in a very small space. So how many actual buildings are on this layout? About 20. And how many of them are pubs? Well, I'm sorry to say, but there's probably about seven pubs on this layout. Seven pubs. And what do you think that says about you? Just well, a question, you don't have to answer. <laughs> I don't know really, but I like pubs for various reasons. I like pubs too. Look at this, so we've got a pub here, pub there, pub here, but it's pubs everywhere, you've got mad in pubs. This must be a very entertaining place on a Saturday night, that's all I can yeah. say. Well, some of them are real buildings, like the prospect of Wimpy there. I was going to put Whitby as it should be, but I couldn't get it in. It was uh, the building smaller than the real one. You've got a lot of things going on here. You've got this narrow gauge tunneling manor, which comes through the town. You've also got this, all that chappy here. Uh, that's uh, a Colonel Stevens rail car set. What was that all about then? Uh, well, Colonel Stevens was a strange character who managed a, a lot of very funny little railways and they decided that uh, steam trains were getting too expensive to run compared to modern motor vehicles and uh, they got some Model T van chassis and they built special railway bodies on top of them. God, must be mad. This is in, what's the Castley chap here then? Well that's actually the Landgate in Rye and I, I was stumped for a way of actually getting the, the main road to, to leave the scene as it were and I came across a photo of this and I thought I'd make a nice model. You know what, well, Brian, I think I could live in a town like this because, I mean, you know, there's so many pubs and there's a little hotel. I'd be a happy man. Absolutely. Which one would you like to live in then? All of them. Right. We're here down by where the river comes out, the main river comes out to meet the sea. This is our river here as it comes underneath the viaducts, various viaducts, various bridges, and out to meet the sea. And we're here to talk about making water because water is a very difficult thing to model, isn't it, Brian? Now, it certainly is. Yeah. Lots of ways we could do it. How could we go about it? Well, the first way is to use flat sheets like glass or perspex or something like that. Or for small areas, you can use thin acrylic sheet. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's an example of this. This is a little puddle you've made. And all you've done is to scoop out the MDF, paint the area with brown acrylic paint, put some clear flat acrylic sheet over the top of it, and then go around it with some um, scatter materials. And um, could we use that on a slightly larger area? Yeah, I mean, on small rivers and streams would be no problem. 
The problem is when you've got to join bits together, you know, you can't get a big enough sheets, so you've got to join them together because you never hide the join. And it's quite good if you want to hide things underneath it, like shopping trolleys and old yeah. fridges and have a bit That's, of fun. That looks really good. Yeah. Now, what we've done is got a section here which represents a piece of riverbed. Now, a lot of people use varnishes, I have done for years, and it's got its advantages and it's got its disadvantages. Uh, the thing is with the new acrylic varnishes, you can pile in quite a lot and it will set, but it can take days. And the big problem there is dust, especially if you're using things like these scatter materials we're using on hills, all it takes is a little drop of that to get in there and the whole thing's ruined. So there's a new product on the market which caught my eye and I insisted that we had a go with. What it is, is this stuff here. It comes in packets and essentially it's little polymer beads. Right, first thing you've got to do is heat it up and because we haven't got a cooker here or anything, we're going to use a camping stove. So what I'm going to do is spark this up, turn him on, fire him up, bosh, off he goes and pop the jolly old polymer. We've got a load of polymer in there. These are just the crystals. You put a little bit in an old saucepan. Don't use the missus's best saucepan for this, you'll go mad. Pop it in there. Now that's going to take a couple of minutes to melt. Looks oh, a bit dude. like sugar, doesn't it? It does look like sugar. A mistake you could easily make. Okay, what I've done is I've heated it up till it's melted into this stuff and it's almost ready to go. All right, Brian, standing by? Yep. I'm going to go for it. This is our riverbed here. And here I go, right, if you hold it, will you move the uh, camping gas stove for me when I'm, I'm ready to go? Yep. Okay, go. Out, out, I'm coming in. Here we go, and I'm pouring. Oh, yeah, not bad, not bad. In fact, what I'll do, if I tip it a little bit, maybe that'll encourage it to run a bit more. There you go. There you go, a bit more. Go on, my son. Of course, I'm cheating a bit because I'm tipping it and we can't tip our layout. But what we could do is just, just want to see what it looks like. Well, I mean, I think overall that's not bad at all. That's quite impressive. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. It looks all right on that. But it has to be said that when we tried it on our main river section here, we did have a few problems. We had a lot of bubbles. Now, one of the things with this product is that you can reheat it using a hot air gun and melt it. But of course, when we tried it with a hot air gun, you have to get up to such a high temperature to remelt the product that it melted all our bridges. And now it started to crack. So to be honest, the jury's out on it. On the day of the funeral, Rose Bean, a little old lady and retired double agent, just happens to be cycling home. She casually observes two lovers enjoying a stroll down by the river. Now, hang on a minute, isn't that Venice Atora? You know, she's the secretary to the recently deceased planning officer, Brian Bennett. And who's she with? Why, it's that unscrupulous MP, Anthony Schooner. Mm -hmm.